There are a number of stories told about the Library of Alexandria that I don't think are necessarily reliable. Uh, there's a story of how it acquired books and how it got books. You know, they would every time a ship would dock at Alexandria, they would take the books off the ship and copy them and give the copies back to the ship. I am skeptical that that actually happened. Um, there's also a story that they tricked the Greeks into giving them all the copies of all the great Athenian dramatists. Again, I'm skeptical of that story. I'm extremely skeptical of the story of the claim that the library included hundreds of thousands of volumes. That's just absurd. Um, and I have reasons for thinking that, but I don't want to derail the video and talking about, you know, going into all of that. What I want to talk about in this video is the most egregious myth, the biggest myth, and the most famous one, the one that everyone's heard about, which is that a villain came along at some point and destroyed the library. Uh, there are three villains that this act is attributed to. Uh, according to one version of the story, and, and by this I mean modern day tellings of the history of the library, there are three different modern versions of the destruction of the Library of Alexandria. One of those says that Julius Caesar did it in 48 BC, accidentally in the course of a battle. Another story says the Christians did it in 391. Um, and then the third is that the Muslims did it when they conquered Egypt in 641. None of those are true because the Library of Alexandria did not actually come to a dramatic end at a single point in time at the hands of a single nefarious actor. That's not what happened. But first of all, I want to clarify there were two different libraries. And this is where some confusion happens because in the popular version of the myth, those two libraries are kind of mashed together. Uh, but actually, there were two separate libraries. The first one was at the museum. Uh, museums in the ancient world were temples dedicated to the nine muses of Greek mythology. Uh, they were places of worship. So different from how a modern museum is. Uh, there was this big museum that was built in Alexandria in the early days of the Ptolemaic dynasty. And uh, it housed within it a library. And that was not unusual. That was common for temples in the ancient world to include a library, a collection of books. Uh, but this one became very famous because it had a reputation for being large, at least in retrospect. Like later authors, hundreds of years later, would talk about, oh, the library back then was really big. It's probably worth noting that we don't have any contemporary sources talking about the library in its heyday. All of our information about the library comes from later authors from hundreds of years later talking about it in retrospect. And there's probably a little bit of a like a golden age nostalgia thing going on in the way they talk about it sometimes. Uh, but anyway, in the third century BC, the museum was founded and it included a library as part of the museum, the temple complex. Now that was back in the Ptolemaic dynasty in the aftermath of the conquests of Alexander the Great. And the museum lasted for several centuries, then it came to an end in the Roman period. And then there was a second library, which was housed at a different temple called the Serapeum. The Serapeum was a temple dedicated to the god Serapis. And that's from the later Roman period. Now, there are some things about the story that are true. It is true that uh, there was a library at the museum. It is true that it was founded in the 3rd century BC, at least it's probably true. I mean, there's been some questioning of that in the literature recently, but probably 3rd century BC. It is true that it uh, accommodated scholars, and these scholars had come in from different areas of the Hellenistic world. It's true that they did science and literature. Well, at least we think so. I mean, we don't have any direct evidence of that, but we know that there were intellectuals working in Alexandria in the 3rd century BC. It seems reasonable that they would have been at the library there. And so that's the closest we get to the myth of this wonderful institution, this sort of research institute with this, you know, library collection and people doing science together. That was third century BC. If you read about the Library of Alexandria in a modern work, like a modern article or something, it'll often name scientists and literary figures that were working there at the time. But all of these example figures that they give are people who lived in the third century BC. 
or perhaps early 2nd century BC. And there's a reason why those names are always from that time period, from the early Ptolemies, and not from later. It's because that's when the Library of Alexandria was actually really active and important, not later. When you get into the mid to late 2nd century BC, things take a turn for the worse. Now, we don't have direct evidence of this about the library itself, because in fact, we have extremely little information to go on about the library itself in terms of historical data. We have no archaeological information, or virtually none. The site of the museum has not been excavated. And literary references to the library are very rare. We have just a few mentions in various uh, sources, usually just mentions in passing when talking about something else. So we have extremely limited information to go on. But we do know some things that were happening in Alexandria and in Egypt in the 2nd century BC, because we know about the general political history of the Ptolemies. And we know that during the course of the 2nd century, the situation in Egypt got appreciably worse compared to the 3rd century. Back in the 3rd century BC, Egypt was prosperous, the Ptolemaic Empire was stable and powerful, and that's the period in which the uh, main patronage of the library took place. And all of the stories, by the way, that talk about the library, always talk about it in that time period, talk about the library under Ptolemy II or Ptolemy III. Those are both third century rulers. Uh, but getting into the second century, the Ptolemaic Empire contracted. It lost territory. Uh, there were sometimes invasions by the, from the Seleucids in the course of Ptolemy you know, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids would fight wars with each other, and Seleucids sometimes their troops would reach uh, the Nile Delta. Uh, there were riots in Alexandria from time to time. There were civil wars in the country. And Alexandria became a much less inviting place for scholars to go to work in. Uh, probably the most dramatic event from this time period, there was a civil war, and one side of the civil war was Ptolemy VIII. Well, he came in and he regained control of Alexandria and then implemented reprisals against his political opponents there, including a lot of philosophers who had been supporters of his opponent in the Civil War. In the course of these reprisals, some of the philosophers in the city lost their lives, others left the city. And there were other places for scholars to go. Sometimes in the modern myth about the Library of Alexandria, there's this implied idea that Alexandria's library was the library, the only library that contained all the world's information, and there was no other library anywhere else. That's not true. There were libraries all over the Hellenistic world. There were other places for scholars to go and do the thing that they had been doing at the museum. There were uh, Hellenistic rulers all over that were, would gladly be patrons of philosophers and literary figures. Uh, and so, instead of going to Alexandria, they went to Greece or Asia Minor. Uh, the most notable of these locations was Pergamum, which is in Asia Minor. And it was, uh, for a long time, an intellectual rival of Alexandria. Uh, Alexandria. It had its own library. It had its own you know, uh, you know, set of scholars that did work there. That doesn't mean the museum ceased to function or the library ceased to function. They continued on throughout that period. And they still had people working there and presumably, you know, doing something, I don't know, studying poetry or something. But they would have been, you know, more like local talent, um, not big names on the international scene. And there's something worth noting here, and that is the, the realistic lifespan of a papyrus roll. Um, there have been papyrus documents found in Egypt that date back hundreds, even thousands of years. But those papyrus documents were found in very dry conditions. But Alexandria is not a dry place, it's humid. And so the books that were stored there, in, that, in the library there, would not have survived for centuries and centuries. They would have decayed and fallen apart much more quickly, probably within a century or so. And that's something to keep in mind when talking about the destruction of the library, sometimes the destruction of the library, it's like it was created in the 2nd century BC and then it was destroyed in the 4th century AD. That's, what, 600 years? Or if it was destroyed by the Muslims, that'd be eight, 900 years? Um, it's, none of the books 
that were put into the library in the third century BC would have lasted that long. There would have to be other books. And that requires constant maintenance. You know, having the staff on hand to do all the copying and maintain that collection over a period of centuries, constantly recopying century after century after century. And that presumes that the library was a stable and functioning and well-funded institution all through those centuries, which it wasn't necessarily the case. You know, I mentioned Ptolemy VIII going in and wreaking havoc with the scholarly community in Alexandria. That was not an isolated case. There were other cases of that sort of thing happening. So by the time we get to Caesar in 48 BC, the library was very likely smaller than it had been in the 3rd century BC. Now, Caesar was fighting in a battle. He set fire to some Egyptian ships. That fire spread onto the land and affected some buildings on the land. We don't know which buildings or to what extent that fire spread. But depending on how we interpret the sources, the fire either affected the library at the, at the museum or it burned some other books elsewhere in the city. I'm inclined to think, after looking at the sources, that the fire affected the library directly and destroyed some of the books there. Uh, but there are historians who take both positions on that. But there's one aspect of this I want to call attention to. Two of the sources that we have about Caesar's fire say that he destroyed the entire library. And those are both 2nd century sources, so they're roughly 200 years after the event. One is Plutarch at the beginning of the century, and Gellius at the end of the century. Again, this is 2nd century AD, so 100s AD. Now, neither of those are, like, especially reliable historical sources. You know, we kind of have to take whatever they say with regard to historical events with a grain of salt. But they are both indications of how you know, like an educated lay person in the second century would see things. And the fact that both of them say that the great library of Alexandria was destroyed, and they, they say Julius Caesar did it, but the fact that they were able to say that the library was destroyed in the first century BC indicates that it was not a ridiculous thing for someone to say in the second century AD. In other words, people in the second century AD evidently did not think of the Great Library of Alexandria as something that was contemporaneous with them. They saw it as something in the past. So the picture that forms in my mind is that the library was created in the 3rd century BC, and it was kind of that idealized version, or at least the closest we come to the idealized version of the Library of Alexandria existed then. But it went through a period of decline in the later Ptolemaic period, and then Julius Caesar's fire either did not affect the library or affected it, but either way, the library was already a shadow of its old self. And then it basically ceased to exist in the form, in like the mythological form of it, in that legendary form of it. It ceased to exist by the time you get to the first century, second century AD. Now, we see an indication of this with Strabo. Strabo was a geographer who lived in the late first century BC and early first century AD. In other words, around the time of Christ. But he wrote a geographical work. And in this work, at, there's one point in the work where he is talking about Eratosthenes. And he says, he has read many historical treatises, meaning Eratosthenes has, with which he was well supplied if he had a library as large as Hipparchus says it was. So here, Strabo is basically saying that back in Eratosthenes' time, the library was very large. So, you know, and, and he was in Alexandria at the end of the first century BC, two or three decades after Julius Caesar's fire. And, and he describes the museum, but he doesn't mention the library at the museum, which is not necessarily a significant thing. Oh, actually, I guess it is significant if the library really had still been a big deal in the first century. But that just, for me, that Strabo quote really reinforces this, this, sequence of events. From Strabo's point of view, at the end of the Ptolemy, actually not the end of the Ptolemaic period, the Ptolemaic period was over now, the very beginning of Roman Egypt. From his point of view, the Library of Alexandria was something that existed in the past. The Library of Alexandria of legend, I should say. There were still libraries in Alexandria, as there were still libraries elsewhere in the Roman world. But this idea of this enormous library, with all of this scholarship happening there, was something that was 
in the past from Strabo's point of view. So at that point, you can't talk about a great library of Alexandria after that. You can't talk about the Christians or the Muslims destroying a great library of Alexandria. It was already gone before you get to the end of the first century BC. But do we blame Julius Caesar then? Is it Julius Caesar's fault the li great library was destroyed? I don't think so because it was already in decline before Julius Caesar came along. And, and I should note, there was still a library after. Like, we have, like, mentions in the historical record of a library existing in Alexandria in the 1st, 2nd, 3rd centuries AD. So, it's, it's not like a library ceased to exist in Alexandria. Uh, the best you could say, or the worst you could say, I guess, depending on how you put it, is that Julius Caesar reduced the size of the collection. But it wasn't, even at his time, it wasn't the big grand thing of legend. Now, I mentioned there were two libraries in Alexandria. There was the Museum Library, which was founded by the Ptolemies, and then there was the Serapium Library, which was in a different part of the city at a different temple. Now, the Museum Library continued on for a while. We don't know exactly when it ended. We know when the museum, as a physical object as a physical complex came to an end, and that was when Aurelian uh, sacked Alexandria in 272 at the end of the third century crisis. Um, the museum and the rest of the palace complex in that part of town was all raised to the ground. Uh, we don't know what happened to the books that were at the museum, assuming there were still books in the museum at the time, we just don't know. Because by that time in the third century, the museum was no longer considered the great library. Like I said, it wasn't considered the great library even hundreds of years before that. But um, the main library or the most prestigious library of the city was now held at the Serapium. And the Serapium was also a very old cultic site. It had been a temple also founded by the Ptolemies. But that old Ptolemaic temple to Serapis had burned in 181. And then the Romans rebuilt the temple on a grander scale. And it was that temple that housed the books that are referred to as the Library of Alexandria in stories about the Christians slash Muslims destroying the great Library of Alexandria. That's referring to the Serapium Library. But the Serapium Library was not the great library in the sense that the legends would have us believe. Like they did not have, as far as I know, I, I mean, there's still a lot for me to read about the Serapium, but based on what I've read so far, it did not have a coterie of scholars paid for by the government doing science and philosophy. It did not have an enormous library, a, you know, world-renowned library. It did not, definitely did not contain all the world's knowledge in its library. It was just your standard temple library that any pagan temple would have. And the Serapium was a very large temple. And by the end of the 4th century, it was the main pagan temple in town. So yeah, it probably had the largest library in the city. But that's not to say it was the great library of legend. It was simply a temple library. So when the Christians destroyed the Serapeum in 391, they were not destroying the library of Alexandria of legend. Uh, we don't even know if they were destroying the library that happened to be housed at the Serapeum. Uh, the accounts of the destruction of the Serapeum, uh, we have an, several sources about it. Some of them are pretty detailed, but none of them mention books. They always talk about how the, the cult statue of Serapis was destroyed. They talk about other events going on surrounding that whole situation of the destruction of the temple, but they don't mention any books being there. They don't mention a library being destroyed. And it might not even be the case that books were destroyed, even if books were housed there. The temple complex was this plaza, and then uh, there was in the in the not in the middle, but kind of in the middle, there was the the actual structure that was the temple of Serapis, and then there were a couple of other, other structures in the middle of the plaza, and then around the edge of the plaza was a colonnade, or a double colonnade, and then there were little rooms off the colonnade, and that's where the books would, were held, and the books were held in wooden chests because we're not in the time of papyrus rolls anymore, like back in the time of the Ptolemies. Uh, 
Now books are in the form of codices, you know, a, you know, have a codex, which opens like this, like a book, like, you know, our modern books are codices. So there, you know, that was how the library was arranged. It wasn't like shelves and shelves and the Christian mob just went in and burned all the books, all the scrolls, whatever. That's not what happened. They went in and attacked the temple itself, but the plaza was left intact and I believe the colonnade was left intact too. Now they may have gone into those rooms and got opened up the chests and destroyed the books that were inside. But there's no mention of that in the sources. Maybe the Christians destroyed the books. Maybe the Christians took the books and kept them. Maybe they distributed them to churches. Maybe they sold them on the open market. We don't know what happened to those books. I mentioned there were three villains of the story, depending on what version of the story you hear, either Julius Caesar did it, or the Christians did it, or the Muslims did it. You can probably guess what I think of the claim that the Muslims destroyed the Library of Alexandria, but I'm not going to talk about that here in this video. If you want to hear more about that, check out Al-Muqaddama's video. He talks all about that. Uh, the link is up there and in the description below. Now, with regard to the legend uh, and the legendary destruction of the library, I want to leave you with three points. First of all, the end of the Library of Alexandria did not cause a Dark Age, obviously, because if it ended before even the time of Julius Caesar, you know, then there was, you know, that's, there's no connection between those two. Secondly, the Library of Alexandria was not the only library in the world. There were other libraries in the Greco-Roman world. So destroying that one library is not going to, by itself, cause a cataclysmic loss in human knowledge. Number three, historical processes usually have complex causes. It's not common for a single historical event, such as the destruction of, of a library, for example, for that to have enormous repercussions that would reverberate through centuries of history. Usually, uh, big changes, big historical changes, such as shifts in knowledge, shifts in worldview, shifts in religion, things like that, are not caused by a single thing. They're caused by lots of different factors. Don't forget to check out Al-Muqaddama's video, and thanks for watching.